Deliberate practice is one of the main ideas that has come out of the research on learning in the past 30 or 40 years. Pretty much everyone agrees that a special kind of practice, which we call deliberate practice, is essential to building expert level skills. But not this guy. This is David Hambrick, and he's a professor at the University of Michigan, and he's written a number of papers with his colleagues criticizing the idea of deliberate practice and the importance of it for developing expert level skills. Are they right? Kind of. In a minute, I'm going to talk about his arguments, but first I want to talk a little bit about the development of deliberate practice so that we're all on the same page and we all understand what, what we're talking about, myself included. Deliberate practice really begins with a question. Why do some people become experts and other people do not become experts? And Anders Ericsson and his colleagues were exploring this question in the early 90s and their research looked at groups of experts and groups of amateurs and tried to explain what the difference between these groups are. For instance, they looked at professional violinists and they looked at amateur violinists and they tried to figure out all the things that, that professionals and amateurs do and all the things that they did even from the time they were children to make one person say become a professional and another person become an amateur even though they may have started at essentially the same place as a kid. And what they observed was that the professionals engaged in a different kind of practice, usually with a instructor or a coach. And what happened was that the instructor would identify key skills for the budding student violinist. Uh, the, the violinist would practice the really parts that were challenging for them, the, the, the parts they were having the most trouble with, and they would reflect on their own practice, and then they would get expert feedback from the mentor or the instructor, and then finally, they would have more opportunities to practice again. So these are the core elements of deliberate practice that Anders Ericsson argued drove expertise forward. Notice how this is different from just spending time practicing. If you don't have that structure to your practice, then you're just practicing. You're just, say, spending time playing the piano, you know, every day for a half an hour like I did as a kid without really much guidance or instruction or effort. Since the 90s, this idea has blown up. People have applied this idea of deliberate practice to every kind of domain you can think of. Uh, sports of every kind, dancing, medicine. Ideally, any time you want people to develop a high level of skill, you are using deliberate practice to structure their learning experiences. As evidence in favor of deliberate practice accumulated, Anders Ericsson came to believe that performance in any kind of domain, uh, chess, running, surgery, spelling bees, all came down to the amount of deliberate practice that students got. So if you've logged more deliberate practice hours than me at something, then it's very likely that you're also better than me at that thing. This is where David Hambrick and his colleagues come in to say, hey, not so fast. One of their key papers was a meta-analysis looking at all of the studies linking deliberate practice and performance outcomes. And what they found was something like 30% of the variation in performance could be explained with deliberate practice. So uh, the rest is other factors like working memory capacity or certain genetic things or how you were raised as a kid and maybe a bunch of other stuff that we don't even know about. They don't have a really good explanation for the missing variation. So their conclusion was that deliberate practice was important, but not crazy important. Now remember, Anders Ericsson would say something closer to like 90 or 95% of the variation performance outcomes could be explained with deliberate practice. And he did his own meta-analysis with much of the same studies using slightly different methodology. And uh, that meta-analysis, of course, supports his opinion. I think there are three issues that are important to understanding this controversy. The first is that the question that researchers are interested in is different than the question that teachers and trainers are interested in. So researchers are interested in understanding why some groups of people reach expert levels while other groups do not. That is a scientific question. 
teachers and trainers are interested in a much more engineering-like question. They want to know, well, what's the best way to structure a learning experience for a student if we want them to reach a high level of expertise? So let's assume for the moment that Hambrick is right and 30% of performance outcomes can be explained with deliberate practice and 70% is just stuff that we can't control. It could still be the case that structuring learning experiences according to deliberate practice principles would be the right thing to do. That's still how you are going to develop students' expertise the quickest. Second, the definition of deliberate practice matters. David Hambrick and his colleagues have argued that at times deliberate practice has seemed a little, a little too flexible. Sometimes when you're reading about deliberate practice, it seems like it can only be designed by an instructor or a coach. Other times it seems like something that the learner can do themselves or something that they can structure themselves. And obviously this changes as you develop expertise. You start out, you don't even know what the key skills are, and then eventually you learn what the key skills are and maybe you get to a level where you know you are one of the only people that can really help yourself learn more because you become you become such an expert. In domains like spelling or chess, deliberate practice is often about doing things by yourself, doing things alone. But in other domains like rugby, for example, deliberate practice is about doing things with a group because that's what the key skill is. Hard to play rugby by yourself. I have to agree a little bit with Hambrick and his colleagues here. When the definition becomes too flexible, it's easy for deliberate practice to become a rationalization rather than a real explanation. So you might say things like, oh, my training program didn't work because it wasn't real deliberate practice. Or you might say something like, well, obviously this group did better because they were doing deliberate practice, even though whatever it was they were doing, you wouldn't call it deliberate practice unless you knew that they actually did well. That's part of the reason why I come back to these factors of deliberate practice that I mentioned earlier over and over again. If you start chiseling away these factors, then you've got something less than the kind of full deliberate practice regime. Third, how you measure deliberate practice matters. One of Erickson's main beefs with the Hambrick meta-analysis was that Hambrick and his colleagues included studies that just measured total practice time instead of deliberate practice specifically. I think this is a problem probably with both meta-analyses. For instance, research looking at spelling bee competitions used time spent looking at words alone as a measure of deliberate practice. But once you start doing things like this, you throw the whole definition of deliberate practice out the window. The simple fact is, is it's hard to measure deliberate practice, which is why researchers use indirect measures to try to get at what's going on, at the kind of practice that students are doing. But when you rely on these indirect measures, you're also relying on a set of assumptions which don't always hold true. That's why I don't really trust the numbers coming out of either meta-analysis. I think there's enough evidence to show that deliberate practice is a major part of becoming an expert. But not all kinds of practice are at this high level of deliberate practice, and not all kinds of practice is, ju is just completely kind of useless, quote unquote, regular practice. There's kind of a sliding scale between the two. But there are other things going on that can help explain expertise development. And I think those are worth exploring too. That's it. If you like this style of video, you gotta let me know by uh, liking the video and writing a comment down below. If you have a specific research topic in learning that you want me to tackle, let me know and I'll see if I can do that in a future video. Peace everyone, bye.